Well, well, well. You're back. You haven't abandoned the course just yet. Well, that's good news. Welcome to part two of this lecture where I'll be talking about regions and regional behavior. In this second half of the lecture, we'll have a look at the importance of geography and space and time in relation to our social interactions, or as Goffman calls them, our performances. We'll be looking at the different regions surrounding performances, particularly the front stage, which is where the performance unfolds, and the backstage, which is where we prepare either individually or as a team for the performance. Let's get started, shall we? So this chapter is all about perceptual boundaries. There is a clear division between what we can perceive, uh, where we can perceive it, and when we can perceive it, versus everything else that we cannot perceive. Goffman defines a region as any place bounded by barriers to perception. He divides the world up into three regions. There's the front region, the back region, and what he calls simply the outside. So the front region is, to continue with the theater metaphor, the stage. This is the place where our performances take place. It could be inside or it could be outside. It could be at work or in a home. But crucially, the front region is a place that's visible by the audience. That is to say that the audience is allowed to see this space. Then there is the back region. Now, this is a behind-the-scenes space, or really anywhere where the audience is not allowed. The back region can also be inside or outside, as long as there are no people other than team members in that space. So classic back regions include, for example, our bedrooms uh, or private spaces in our homes, or for example, in a public space, back regions might include the restrooms or the toilets. So these are places where we don't have to perform. We can relax without the eyes of the audience on us. We can rehearse our performances either individually or as a team. We can get dressed up and pay close attention to the image that we are trying to project, or we can simply let our image go because we're in a safe space. So Goffman argues that the boundary between front region and back region can be both spatial and temporal. A spatial boundary means that the front stage and the backstage are located in separate places. For example, the front stage for a teacher is the classroom, whereas the backstage can be, for example, the staff common room, or somewhere in the teacher's private home, or as I said, maybe the toilets of the school. This boundary can also be temporal, meaning that it changes across time. Thus, for example, the classroom might be front stage when it's filled with students, but it becomes a backstage when the students leave the room. Finally, Goffman defines the outside as virtually everywhere else. This includes places that are neither front stage nor backstage for us. So we know that there's a lot of interaction going on out there all the time in this world, but we can only see a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Most of it is outside of our perception. So if we think about the front region as a stage, it necessarily follows that it must also have a setting. The setting consists of what Goffman calls fixed sign equipment. All else being equal, the more control that a team or an individual performer has over the setting, the more successful the performance will be. Fixed sign equipment is visible. It includes things like your clothing, your makeup. Maybe there's a computer or a phone in the setting. Maybe there are tables or chairs or other kinds of furniture. Or maybe there are books in the background, right? So if you're trying to project the image of an intellectual, it might help to have a lot of books behind you. 
So all of these props should be aligned with your definition of the situation. If you're carrying out a serious performance, it's important that the setting is serious as well. Right? You wouldn't hang a pinata at a funeral, for example. Then there's what Goffman calls decorum. So decorum refers to the behavior of performers when they're in the front region. Decorum is divided into two parts. There's moral decorum and instrumental decorum. Moral decorum means that we're expected to be good to each other, okay? Instrumental decorum means that we should adhere to the conventions of appropriate conduct. So these behaviors or, or acts of decorum include, for example, etiquette, politeness, impulse control, withholding our animal instincts, paying attention to others when they're talking, chivalry, not interrupting others, not using violence against each other, right? These kinds of behaviors are expected in the front regions of a civilized society. And we're governed by the rules of conduct that are based on mutual respect and social interaction. So decorum is obviously important in a workplace context as well. We don't wear, for example, swimming suits to the office, right? We don't listen to really loud music in an open plan space. We don't, or at least we shouldn't, spend the whole day surfing the web or indulging in our favorite foods. We are punctual when we show up to meetings. And when other people are speaking at work, we try not to interrupt them, right? These behaviors uh, are on occasion violated by employees, right? Sometimes they don't live up to the general rules of social interaction in that particular context. But when they are violated, there are negative consequences for those who break the rules of engagement at work, right? They can be uh, disciplined, they can be punished, or they can even be sacked or terminated. Okay, so one interesting concept that Goffman writes about in the context of the workplace is what he calls make work. So make work refers to when employees, in Goffman's words, pretend to be working hard in the front region, but in fact they aren't working hard at all. Now we've all done this before we create the illusion that we're hard at work, but we're really not that hard at work. I think this brutally honest clip from the movie Office Space really shines a light on Goffman's concept of make work. Slide down, this is my associate, Bob Porter. Oh, hi, Bob. Bob, you want to go ahead and grab a seat and join us for a minute. You see, what we're actually trying to do here is we're just... We're trying to get a feel for how people spend their day at work. So if you would, would you walk us through a typical day for you? Yeah. Great. Well, I generally come in at least 15 minutes late. Uh, I use the side door. That way Lumberg can't see me. <laughs> and uh, after that, I just sort of space out for about an hour. Until but, I uh, space out? Yeah. I just stare at my desk, but it looks like I'm working. I do that for uh, probably another hour after lunch, too. I'd say in a given week, I probably only do about 15 minutes of real, actual work. Uh, Peter, would you be a good sport and indulge us and just tell us a little more? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something about TPS reports. Uh, TPS the thing is, Bob, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that I just don't care. Don't, don't care? It's a problem of motivation, all right? Now, if I work my ass off and Initech ships a few extra units, I don't see another dime. So where's the motivation? And here's something else, Bob. I have eight different bosses right now. A big pardon? Eight bosses. Eight? Eight, Bob. So that means that when I make a mistake, I have eight different people coming by to tell me about it. That's my only real motivation, is not to be hassled. That and the fear of losing my job. But you know, Bob, that'll only make someone work just hard enough not to get fired. Would you 
Bear with me for just a second, please. Okay. What if, and believe me, this is so <laughs> hypothetical. But what if you were offered some kind of a stock option equity sharing program? Would that do anything for you? I don't know, I guess. Listen, I'm going to go. Uh, it's been really nice talking to both of you guys. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. The Thank pleasure's you. all on this side yes. of the table, trust me. Good luck with your layoffs, all right? I hope your firings go really well. Thanks a lot. Great. Yeah. Wow. Let's talk a bit more about the back region. This is a place where we can really let our guard down. It's a place where we don't have to worry about being judged by the prying eyes of the audience. We usually take care of our biological needs in the back region, things like urination, defecation, and copulation, that is, of course, sexual intercourse. These things usually take place in the back region. This is also a place where we prepare individually or in a team for our performances. We run through the script in our minds. We think about what we're going to say when interacting with the audience later, how we're going to say it, and what we're going to wear when we say it. Goffman defines the back region as a place, often adjacent to the front region, where the impression fostered in the front stage is knowingly contradicted and prepared for. All of the lies, deceptions, and misrepresentations that we use in front of the audience can be openly discussed here. We ready stage props and equipment. We sometimes rehearse, again, either individually or in a team, our performances, and we look for flaws that can be corrected. When a team member is not performing effectively, this is the place where we can train that person to be a more effective performer. Obviously, the back region must be hidden from the audience because the secrets of the performance are openly discussed and the actors are not in character, so to speak. It's a bit like the Wizard of Oz lurking behind the curtain, hoping that the audience will buy into the false impression that he is trying to project. Please, sir, we've done what you told us. We brought you the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. We melted her. Oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, but I want to go home now. You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures. Think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad So, wizard. Goffman argues that audience segregation is essential to maintaining an effective performance. This means that audiences must be prevented from seeing the performer in the back region. It also means that different audiences cannot overlap. So when an audience gets a glimpse of the back region, the performance is seen to be what it is, which is just an illusion. They can see that the performers are not who they claim to be. Again, the lies, deception, and misrepresentation are revealed to the audience, leaving the impression that we're trying to foster in tatters. 
the performance is discredited when these regional boundaries are breached. The extent to which a performance is discredited obviously depends on what the audience sees behind the scenes. The back region, for example, can be a place for secret racists or criminals or sexual deviants. But a performance can still be discredited when more innocuous behavior is witnessed by the audience. So for example, opening a bathroom stall and seeing your boss sitting on the toilet can certainly disrupt the impression that he or she is trying to foster. It could even be more embarrassing to run into a colleague or a coworker in a porn shop or a brothel. It's also important to keep different audiences separate from each other. For example, you might be presenting a responsible professional self to your boss, but a wild and carefree self with your friends. This is why I think social media can be so dangerous to young people these days. You might not want your boss to see photos of you partying with your friends and puking in the street after a long night of drinking. This is a classic example of failure to keep your audiences separate. Okay, so I'd like you to now spend some time reflecting on how the concepts of front and back regions are relevant to the workplace. Think about the workplaces you've been to recently. You should be able to see that the workplace setting is highly staged. This is especially the case in the interactive services sector. I'm talking about retail settings, restaurants, etc. The geography of these places is tightly regulated. The front region, which is where the customer is allowed, is often aesthetically pleasing and well decorated. A huge amount of marketing science has gone into the question of how to design a retail space so as to encourage consumption. Even the employees that work in customer-facing service sector roles tend to be more attractive looking, which is all part of the impression that the company is trying to foster, right? So if you're trying to sell clothes, for example, to young people, you might want the frontline staff in your shop to wear those clothes and to look like models. You want the front stage to appear cool and crisp. Now behind the scenes, for example, in the common room, the atmosphere isn't tightly regulated because this is a space outside the sight of the customer. It might be dirty, it might be smelly. The employees can take off their ties and relax. They can swear. Uh, they can talk negatively about the customers there. The difference between the behavior of individuals at work and at home is even greater. At home, the employee is not an employee at all. He or she can wear whatever they want, say whatever they want, and not have to worry about the customer experience. But once they return to work, a different set of social rules apply as they go back into character, so to speak. Okay, so the final region that Goffman discusses is what he calls the outside. We never get to see or experience the outside. We know it exists somewhere, but we're never a part of it. It's neither front stage nor backstage, at least for us. It might be for other people, but for us, it's not front stage and it's not backstage. The outside is beyond the scope of our perception, and the people there are neither team members nor members of the audience. What happens in the outside is usually not relevant to your own performance. However, when an outside person walks in on your performance, this has the potential to disrupt the impression you're trying to foster. This is why control over the geographical boundaries is so important to effective performance management. If the back region is a space that's locked behind a closed door, then the threat of disruption is obviously low. But if the boundary is more fluid, sometimes people can accidentally walk in on a performance leading to various problems. This is especially true 
of your performance, whether backstage uh, preparing for the performance or front stage giving the performance, when it's illegal or immoral. If an employee, for example, is having sex with a coworker in the office, they certainly don't want the boss or a customer to walk in on them. Controlling the boundaries here is essential in that kind of a situation. All right, that draws this week's lecture to a close. Thanks very much to everyone for hanging in there. I'll see you next week when we'll be continuing our exploration of Goffman's dramaturgy. Bye for now.